My name is Daphne Ayas and I'm the director here at Witte de Wit. I'm thrilled to be joined by Ari Benjamin Mayers and his guests, as well as all of you. We really did not anticipate this crowd for such a terrific weather, so thanks for being here today. Kunsthalle for music is an idea that we, I came actually sort of, I run into in the book of music on display, which is an interview between Ari and Marie France. And it was in one of those lines and I thought, wow, this would be wonderful to zoom in and try to instigate. And a few meetings with Ari, we decided to actually to go for it. And at that moment, the idea of Kunstalia for music was they may be more than born. Um, a space and space for music as imagined by a conductor and composer who had multiple experiences in the art world as a collaborator, composer, and artist, if we may say so. And he himself is very much exploring the structures and the processes that are embedded in the social and ephemeral nature of music. So as he is navigating the field of art and music, we really wanted to tune into his intuition and see how he could embrace the idea of instituting a Kunstseile for music that is operating at the cross-section of art and music. So as one does with music, we went to many directions with our discussions. And I realized also with some of our guests who are here today, you can go to the Baroque period, you can go to jazz, you can go to Adorno, you can go to institutional critique. So all the guests who are invited actually have long and hard thought about some of the issues that exist vis-a-vis -vis music. And most of you, I bet, who's also in the, in, the, in the audience have also asked similar questions. So here we are actually not to give a final logo in any way, but help shape the thinking that goes into the Kunstsaale for Music, whose inaugural show is going to be in January at Witte de Wit of next year. But to be able to test the idea a little bit, we teamed up with our favorite partner organization in Hong Kong, whose founder is equally invested in music, if not more, and that was two months ago, where Ari was there in residency and created a citywide partnership with various partners and composers. So some of those ideas were tested there. And the curator at large of Spring Workshop is also here, so she can also share her ideas and sort of insight from that experience. Um, we're joined today by Arman Avenasian, who is instigating an active theory production vis-a-vis uh, -vis the instituting practice that we're going for for Kunsthalle for Music. He will introduce the kind of the house rules and the guidelines for the symposium and how we want to cut or circumvent some of the blind corners and spots we may go throughout the symposium, such as the inevitable John Cage question, which comes up every time we mention Kunstale for music, or um, the opposite spectrum of the other end, with music acting as this ultimate phantasm and projection board for all of us. So it can also be as open as possible when we talk about music. So when we go to those blind spots, he will help us navigate the symposium um, sessions. For housekeeping, we're live streaming. The, for bios of the participants, you can refer to the programs. I hope you each have them. And I want to quickly thank to Rosa, our assistant curator, for taming the details of today, wherever she is, and Samuel, who's also on the project. Um, and thanks to the installation team as well. So let it go. Let's start with Ari, and then we go with Armin. OK. <coughs> Loud. OK. Uh, yeah, thank you. I'm going to make this kind of quick because we have a lot um, that we want to talk about tonight and a lot that we want to cover. So I'm going to start uh, before I turn it over to Armin and then he's going to turn it back over to me so that we can then get into the conversation. It's already starting in a kind of, in a sort of Baroque way, but um, I'm going to start just by saying thank you. So th thank you first to Defne and Vita David for initiating this, for, for, for yeah, inviting me to create this and to, to let this happen and for this conference and also to Rosa and Samuel for 
for helping to organize it. Uh, but I very much also want to thank everyone who's here, uh, the participants um, who you will see tonight, most of them, although some of them will be first making their kind of main appearance tomorrow. Um, but I'm, I'm super excited about the group of people that we have um, because it's, uh, I think it's quite unusual that in a discussion like this we actually have uh, thinkers and philosophers but also musicians um, but also performers uh, and composers and that we're all sort of approaching it kind of on the same on the same level and I think that's um, really special and I'm very curious to see what comes out of it because tonight uh, we will be discussing and talking and tomorrow that will continue but tomorrow it moves into a more performative situation um, where we will continue to, to, to sort of continue the discussion but through uh, auditions and performance and actually to start to make uh, the Kunsthalle for music. So really thank you for everybody and thank you uh, everyone else for coming because I know um, the weather is quite nice <laughs> and uh, it's uh, a little bit of a sacrifice maybe to be indoors listening to people talk about a, uh, a, uh, a fictional to, b to come into existence uh, place. So thank you everyone for being here. Um, um, and I, and I want to thank Armin um, who, uh, who helped, helped me organize and conceive the symposium. Um, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to him and then take it back. Yeah. Um I wanted to start with all the thank yous as well, but it has been done a lot. So thanks to everyone that did, that did. Uh, and for Ari, I remember a couple of months ago, we, I think we had dinner or so, and there some, some interesting topics came up as far as I remember, like sentences like, we don't know yet what music is, or um, um, there isn't something like an institution for music, and these kind of um, enigmatic uh, sentences. So uh, the question also became like, uh, how do you do a symposium? What kind of theory actually is needed? What kind of theory practice is needed uh, for a non-existing object or not yet existing institution or an institution that might have started to exist or might, uh, uh, which uh, has an in inauguration that's like two years later or so on. So there's all these paradoxes. So we, we thought um, there's a kind of necessity to do the conference in a, in a different way. So that's why, I mean, we're starting a bit traditional with some uh, majority of theoreticians, so to say, on the table. Um, here, um, but uh, it's a bit of an experimental setup. So what we came up with was uh, the idea of um, a bit unusual, but hopefully productive uh, reversal of roles. So instead of having some theory people, uh, to put it very blunt, uh, explaining the practitioners how the world looks like, we rather wanted to turn it around. So instead of that, we have um, the idea of having several panels where Ari is actually presenting problems, um, unsolved like um, issues, uh, not personal nature, uh, but uh, from his uh, <laughs> career as, as contemporary, com uh, com contemporary <laughs> musician or composer uh, or uh, institution founder and so on. Um, and, uh, and the others are rather like responding uh, and, and discussing the issue. So to always remain like close to, um, to, to the topic. And I have to warn everyone, we have only have 45 minutes and my role is to be really strict. Um, we have not even started with this panel, so we are like minus two minutes <laughs> by now. Um, um, so we, the theoreticians, with the exception of, of our keynote speaker, Peter Osborne, are here to respond, uh, he, uh, here to, to reply, and really um, there might not be too much time, unfortunately, today to discuss also with the audience, but like everything we do today and we discuss today would feed into tomorrow. So you're very much invited to come as well tomorrow and, and uh, continue um, the, the discussion. Um, today we have like uh, three panels, as, as I'm sure you're aware, and I just briefly mention uh, the topics uh, also in order for the panelists uh, to, um, um, to remember and, and, and don't go off, off track because I yeah, uh, have to be strict. Uh, so the first one is, is uh, um, the, there will be a focus on the institution and related topics like education or the front end and back end of, of, um, of institutions. The second uh, panel will be on, with a keynote on the contemporary. Uh, and the third one will be further exploring this topic of the contemporary with, uh, with regards to uh, um, the topic of, of uh, the exhibition. Um, 
that is a bit for you to, to also, uh, if you have questions, of course, if you have questions of understanding, by all means, just, just give me signs. Uh, but that's a bit the trajectory for, for today. Um, yeah. Ari, we want to start with the time. Yeah. It's like 45. No, what, wait 20 seconds. <laughs> um, then we should be. Well. <laughs> should be now. <laughs> off. You go. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to, uh, yeah, just quick to sort of get into it um, uh, and to take one step back before we zoom in here, uh, just to say that, uh, you know, we're already now in the middle of a score that's in progress uh, um, and we're sort of performing it together because this started uh, in November of 2016 uh, with a kind of manifesto or what I would call kind of a soft manifesto that was released uh, via Eflux. Uh, announcing the, the founding of the Kunsthalle for Music. That, that's something was, let's say, that would be something like an introduction. That was then followed uh, by a, um, a long a residency and then a, a show uh, in Hong Kong at Spring Workshop, uh, curated by Christina Lee, who's here with us, called an exi uh, exposition, not an exhibition. And that show uh, very much laid out some of some sort of themes and ideas uh, and try to work through some themes of, of what a possible repertoire could be, how a repertoire could work, uh, what it might be like to, to have a new music ensemble at the center of, a, of an art exhibition at a, at a, uh, in a kind of white cube space. Um, and so that was really something like, uh, yeah, like the title suggests, an exposition. And now we kind of find ourselves uh, uh, at, the, uh, at the, I guess to continue the metaphor, at the development section, uh, uh, which is traditionally considered actually the most interesting part of a, let's say the sonata form, right? Because you have the exposition, the laying out of themes, and you have the development, and then you have the, fina the recapitulation, the finale. And so the show in 2018 the first inaugural show of the Kunsthalle for Music, this is actually, in a sense, the, the recapitulation, the finale, although it's then the finale right away becomes a kind of introduction to the next steps and the next iteration. But right now, and that I think is the exciting part with, with, with everyone who's gathered here, we're really in the middle of, of, of what I'm calling the development in German, Durchführung. And this is always the part of the sonata, you know, Beethoven, whatever, that's like the craziest part. It's the, <laughs> it's the part where the themes go crazy, they go into the most extreme keys. You think to yourself, how will they ever find their way back uh, to those original themes? And yet somehow uh, it usually happens. And that's uh, how I'd like to look at this weekend. You know, I, 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 I hope we go very far, but I also hope we can, we can come back um, to, to the themes and find ourselves again. Um, so that's just s that's where we are in kind of the large, uh, let's say, meta score of this entire Kunsthalle for Music uh, project. But I can I can I ask you because like uh, I definitely briefly mentioned it like this this idea of the institution came out of, of a conversation with with Marie France and so on. But that um, as far as I know, there are certain like not events, but like encounters or problems that, that occurred during your like career as, a, as an artist that somehow triggered this like um, this need or this desire to have uh, found an institution. Like, you know, I mean, yeah. wh wh where does Thank it come you. from and why <laughs> and how? That's, that's Armin's way of saying st uh, stick to the clock, stay on the clock. I get it. That's I <laughs> I'm, I'm interested. No, thank you. Yeah. Well, I wanted to, as a way of getting into the idea of institution, I did want to actually um, start with an example f from my own practice. Um, and here, and do you have the photos? We could put some photos up slowly. There's only a, there's only a few. Um, uh, but this is this is an early, a fairly early piece uh, from 2007. Anyway, from 2007 called. Yeah, there's, are we going to stick with that for now? It, it's, it was a piece called Solo. And um, the reason why I'm bringing it up now is because actually it's, it was a very simple piece. It was, a, it was a piece for one opera singer and one audience member in a, together in a small room. 
Um, and in the score were very detailed instructions about choreography and, and how the singer and the, and the one audience member should interact. Um, and these are some photos of the first uh, version of it that actually took place in a, in, a, in a gallery in Berlin that consisted of just a small uh, porter's lodge. I mean, I think the whole space was maybe two and a half square meters. Um, um, and uh, the singer is Ruth Rosenfeld, and these photos are actually were taken by Douglas Gordon. And the reason why I bring up this piece <coughs> is because I had composed this piece, as I said, actually kind of a simple idea, and um, could, couldn't find, there was no place to do this piece. Um, it, wouldn't, it didn't work in a concert hall. It didn't work in an opera house. It didn't make any sense financially for any kind of music venue to put on because it only had one audience member. Um, and so with this piece and some other pieces I'd been working on, I was suddenly sort of confronted uh, or uh, with the fact that uh, uh, I needed to find a space where, I c where this work could take place because I couldn't, because the, in the musical venues that were open to me, working as a musician or working as a composer, uh, I c it, wasn't, it wasn't possible. Um, where it was very possible, though, uh, was in the art context, because in a museum or a gallery, you could set it up like an installation. People could wait in line. They could take turns. You could have two or three singers working in shifts. And um, it was it was t it was very possible to do it there, and I and that really was a very formative moment for me because it, it this is a composition. I mean, this is a musical work, and yet uh, I needed to turn, let's say, to the art world to find a suitable um, home for this piece. And I would say that even though this is this is going back ten years, this is the type of work that that. Um, sort of got me thinking about the idea of institution. And I think at this point I'll kind of turn it over because what we're now talking about is really um, what could this institution be? Uh, how could it work? Um, what does it mean? Um, also maybe some perspective, some historical perspective. And uh, I'll turn, yeah, turn it During over During breakfast there. you said like I should be like strict with everyone, but I have to be strict with you in the first place because uh, just as a clarification, I think it's really interesting when you said like you you want y you needed to find a space, right? Um, um, or when you say it I it is a composition, uh, but one can set it up as an installation. So I'm wondering like like um, is it ontologically a composition, but then you just okay for the art world do you make it an installation or do you still make this distinction? Or has that changed? Mean meanwhile, I don't know from uh, maybe you might have said, but when when was this piece? Uh, 2007. Have I you think. changed your mind? Was it a composition then? No, no, it you is made it an installation. It is a composition, but as an installation, it worked in, in an art setting. But it's a composition. Maybe that's, uh, if I may, uh, a good start to talk about this idea and this notion of an institution. Um, because as clear as this term seems to be, we are in an institution here. Um, it might be worth thinking about what we mean by that, right? Do we speak of an infrastructure that enables things, as you explain, that you are missing in the realm of music? Or, or and, are we thinking about a mindset, right? And uh, what Armin just asked, I think, is referring more to the question of, of the institution as a mindset, of something that we all um, have inside us when we think of a particular um, artistic field, a discipline, a way of approaching the work of art, be it in a, in a, in a concert hall, be it in, a, um, in an exhibition space, um, when you mix or when you label this new institution a Kunsthalle for music, right? Um, it's not just wording, it's, uh, it, it brings along with it a whole mindset, I think, that and I wonder how important that mindset is as a, let's say, a body of resonance for your own work, but also how you can imagine um, this to become a, a framework, a frame set for others um, to, to get into, but also to work in. 
if you're saying you're going to respond straight away. Yeah. What? No, it's step. Yeah, uh, it's very much a framework. I mean, just you know, it, it's 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 a place that I've been thinking about because of some work that I did. But the reason I think we're here now and thinking about this on a, on a sort of larger scale more is really imagining a kind of uh, institutional framework that could hold uh, a lot of types of work from a lot of different kinds of um, artists. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think this question of you know which aspects of an institution are we actually borrowing when we're thinking about consultative music is absolutely critical, right? Because you mentioned that it is the contemporary art space ultimately that allowed for the kind of liberal, open-minded approach that you required as a composer within the field of music that has a lot of strict formal criteria and understandings of the parameters that are required for your work to be conceived as work. And so I think I you know I, this is the point where I guess the conversation becomes not just about music but also about contemporary art and what a contemporary art institution is. And uh, um, I guess we'll hear more about this in the next presentation, also about a very particular kind of uh, historical constellation that has led to today's paradigm of contemporary art. Um, but what's interesting with the contemporary art institution is that there's this front end, right, which is the space where uh, we intersect with the public, where the artist's work is presented, uh, where the artist is given kind of li the liberty to uh, renego renegotiate reality as they see fit through um, their artwork um, and the general public. And then there's the back end, right? The back end is the infrastructure, as you mentioned, the financial models, um, the kind of the intersections with city policy, state policy, et cetera. And uh, for me, what's really interesting as somebody who is sort of works on questions of institutional strategy is um, how has this kind of development, this between the, the relationship of front end and back end evolved since the 1960s, because effectively with kind of, with conceptual practices, with the rise of conceptual art, uh, let's say with the more Western uh, modern paradigm and uh, let's say in the 1920s, with if we take constructivists also as people who are trying to rethink this negotiation between front end and back end, um, we see that this has been an evolving relationship. So uh, for me, I guess like one of the critical questions that I wanted to address was how you see this intersection and whether the ensemble, which becomes kind of the core through which you think the institutional form, can effectively also become, let's say, a vehicle of sorts or kind of a speculative modeling mechanism through which we rethink this intersection be be between front end and back end and what actually a cultural institution is doing. Um, and you know, you've shared some thoughts about the ensemble and how it functions as an institutional model. So maybe, maybe you could touch a bit on that. Yeah, I, I mean, um, you know, like we, we, s we talked a little bit about before, I think this idea of a, of a front end and back end to an institution is quite interesting. And, and if you apply that idea to a musical situation, um, you start to see that actually in music, this kind of front end, back end thing is, v is actually kind of um, somewhat vague, or let's say much more so, because the analogy would be um, like with an orchestra, that the front end would be something like the composer or the music, and in that case, and the back end would be something like the orchestra actually. But of course the music, we put that on stage. I mean, that's the thing that we're actually kind of, that's in front of us, you know? that's what's actually on display. And so I think to now apply that back to a Kunsthalle for music, I think certainly one aspect would be that this kind of Divide division between what you call the front end and the back end would also probably be much more blurred because um, at the, the heart of the Kunsthalle for Music is an ensemble uh, performing the various works that are on display. And, and that itself also brings forth a lot of different um, um, sort of interesting constructions which I think we can also talk about in this realm of institution which is for instance education. And, and the idea that actually the ensemble is a group that has to be put together, that has to be trained in some way. Um, so there's a whole educational aspect that's not, again, it's, it's, it's uh, through music, it's kind of almost turning on itself because I think the typical, and you could talk about this, you know, both of you could, 
the typical education model is something a bit external, like we have an education division that's reaching out to, and here at the, Kun the Kunsthalle for Music, a big part of this education is actually internal because right. an ensemble needs to be created, an ensemble needs to be trained. So in other we're, we're thinking about a whole different type, uh, what could a, a musician be? A, a in other words, that, that's where the metaphor of the Kunsthalle already ends, right? Um, because all of what you're talking about right now is something that, of course, as we all know, is totally not typical for the Kunsthalle or, or museum or yeah. any kind of that institution. And I find it curious um, that and how in the last years there is this, um, this approach from the performing arts towards the institutions of um, visual arts, um, embracing the institutions of visual arts as infrastructures, as a liberating tool. Um, whereas, to the contrary, uh, you were, I think, briefly mentioning it, uh, s latest since the 60s, um, the visual art, the field of visual art, the artists, and also institution practices, practitioners um, turn to the performing arts in order to escape the constraints of the white cube and uh, time, time structures, um, spatial structures, and so on. So that's an interesting phenomenon, isn't it? It is interesting. And of course, context is very important <laughs> for something like that. It's true. Uh, but you know, again, I mean, the context, I mean, I, you know, coming from, I come from the performing arts, right? Um, as do, I think, a lot of the musicians here and, and, s and the composers. And if you come from that, then of course, the something like a white cube, um, which for many artists, is kind of totally over or no, but coming from the concert house or the opera house, of course a white cube, an empty white cube is extremely liberating. As a space where anything can happen? Or y uh, yeah, well as a space where can I can- be modulated in either way? Yeah, the, there's no one is telling you in a white cube where should the audience be, no one is telling you where should the performers be. And I also, I have to say that, um, and you can speak about this further, you know, this whole, uh, the whole um, um, uh, uh, notion and, and of institutional critique, which is so important for contemporary art and, and, and brought forth really a lot of very important work and, and, and a whole group of artists who really came up in that. Um, I'm going to sort of go on the record as saying that we haven't had that in music. I mean, this, a kind of concerted, I mean, there have been certain voices, of course, people, but a kind of uh, uh, sort of concerted uh, let's, um, a moment of, of institutional critique within the kind of, within the, um, for lack of a better term, music uh, Business or music industrial complex or whatever you want to call it, but this this sort of institutional critique moment uh, has not happened uh, yet. So I think again, I these things can be true. You know, it can be true for an artist at the White Cube that they're running away from it, and at the same time, it can be true that uh, those of us from the performing arts are kind of running towards it, and both of those things can be true at the same time. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned institutional critique. Also, I wanted to say that I really sympathize with this kind of um, use of contemporary art, so to speak, for lack of a better word, in order to do something that isn't possible within your field. Because as somebody who actually moved from human rights into contemporary art, actually it seemed to me that the, this field of contemporary art was much more kind of capable of dealing with the structural questions that ultimately led to human rights violations than the human rights industry, right? Um, but I think what one also quickly realizes, which is also the lesson of institutional critique, is the capacity of the infrastructural back-end aspect of uh, contemporary art to reabsorb institutional critique and to ultimately recapitalize on it. And so this kind of question, I think, of capitalization in contemporary art um, is really important to tackle it head on. And I think especially when we're thinking speculative institutions, right, because it's like it's a reality which is very um, real. <laughs> for lack of a better word, within the sphere. But I think there are possibilities for actually working with it in ways that it isn't possible to work with, you know, capitalization uh, in the futures and derivatives markets, right? So for me, for example, one of the questions that uh, would ultimately, let's say, more directly targeted towards uh, Consalia for Music is, you know, are there certain models for, let's say, 
ownership or distribution of benefits or like you know how are the relationships structured within the ensemble uh, the ensemble and the hosting institutions etc etc and whether these kind of more traditionally managerial bureaucratic uh, you know back end questions can also become integrative aspects of what the work is um, maybe, maybe I can right? like structure that because we have like a, a lot of like interesting but 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 partly contradictory like uh, propositions on the table. Um, at the beginning it started with like, <coughs> are you saying that the, um, in contemporary art there's a different mindset, right? I mean, I could mention like, uh, yeah, um, in, in com or was it you? Yeah, you said I was it was me. <laughs> okay, you, you, okay, you said it with, with the mindset, but there was this idea, uh, or the, um, there's a liberating ef uh, effect uh, or the, the positive, you described in a very positive way that uh, um, some people might see it as a constraint from within the art world, but for coming from music or coming from performance art, this is this is liberating. So it's a description as if like music is like a bit behind, catching up. We didn't have institutional critique, so now we need a Kunst. That sounds like now we need a Kunsthalle. As the, the musicians need one to do institutional critique. We all know like what is going to happen from that in order to catch up. Um, um, uh, but Victoria is somehow like proposing something different. So we have very different temporalities. Yeah? Um, um, uh, for you, it's a bit like, isn't there a potential in integrating like uh, uh, music into this contemporary art field, pushing it beyond itself? And, 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 the, and the, te the text for the, for, the, for the symposium actually says that music has traditionally been a, a driver uh, for the contemporary. So if it has been a driver, it cannot be like behind. So we don't have to solve it and th th it's not like, oh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a mistake or so, but I think that's the interesting question. Uh, what, what is the, the aim for, for Kunsthalle and why does it, um, why are you uh, looking for, for, for an building an institution and not just, okay, let's have more uh, uh, music in, in, in an art context. So it's not like a liberating mindset, whoever said it, that is, is looked for, but really an institution. But the question is what kind of, a, a contemporary one again, to do then the self-critique and, and so on, or uh, change the back end or the front end or like, so I just wanted to put it on the table, otherwise we have like different, different uh, uh, contradictory positions. Um, I look at you, uh, but. I don't want to say anything. Enhancing the performance part. Um, well, the title of the symposium is, or meeting, is music is not. And I understand it in the way that music is not something that is simply there, graspable as an object, as one would have it in the tradition of, of the field of visual art, but something that is existing only when it's becoming, in the state of becoming, right? Is that in a way? So, would one. Um, trajectory of an institution like a Kunsthalle for Music would be the equivalent. Would that be the equivalent that the, an institution like a Kunsthalle for Music is not, but is by necessity always something that's in the state of becoming? Yeah, it's a good way to put it, be, you know, because um, again, you know, this idea of the Kunsthalle for Music is not simply let's build a building and put some music inside of it. it it's, it's, much, it's much bigger than that in the sense that it's really thinking what can we, what are musical processes that can actually inform how an institution works and, and exists. In that sense, I, you know, I'm going to um, disagree a little bit with Armin. I think he puts it a little bit too, uh, too much in contradiction, a little bit too dialectically, <laughs> if I can say. Uh, uh, because actually, for instance, a lot of this, what you've brought up, is not in opposition to each other. Music historically had been, was at the avant-garde, was pushing things, but this changed. Um, we can talk about when and how this changed. It had a lot to do with recording, uh, starting about 90 years ago. It's a little bit of a different uh, subject, but that's, it, it's not negating. I mean, it, it had been, and then something changed, and now music finds itself in a, in a, in a different position. It actually finds itself um, even asking what it is. That's the other part of this uh, title, Music Is Not. It's on one hand very much what you said, but of course it's also um, th a question in a way. Music, well, wh what is music not? Um, and um, um, the Kunsthalle for Music, a certain one answer of what music is not 
um, is that music is not a medium. I mean, it should be clear we're talking about a live, uh, a live social and spatial practice. I mean, that's that's what we are talking about in regards to the Kunsthalle for music. Um, but getting back to also what Veronica said, I mean, I think that um, you know that actually this new like these kinds of ways of maybe thinking about well, how would the ensemble and you know be um, integrated or how or even something like how, um, about about payment or about um, ownership again I don't see it as a, as a contradiction I see it actually as, as the thinking which is why we're here which could inform a kunst a kunsthalle for music and I, I also think that this this different temporalities can of course be solved by having a historical look but that's a bit what what I was uh, uh heading towards, like you said some specific things about uh, the music, but the question to, to the others or to all three of you would be like maybe to, to think a bit or tell us a few things about like historical difference with uh, about institutions, about art institutions uh, and the relationship between music and, and uh, or music, musical institution historically. Um, uh, we, we, we said we don't want to talk about cage or so, or there's five euro extra payment for everyone who mentions it. <laughs> but like um, uh, that, that would be a question to to uh, to uh, the two of you, like about the historical precedences of. of, of well, institutionally speaking, um, I'd say there are no precedent precedences. There are precedences in the sense that there were we see the introduction of performative formats into the realm of or the field of visual art via the formats of a festival, um, via performance evenings, either musical or not. Um, but institution, uh, in a stricter sense, institutional, I don't really see that there are any. Of course, coming from the field of visual art, one maybe, and maybe it's a trap, immediately starts thinking about other artists setting up institutions like uh, Marcel Brotas or all the artists who, who did their idiosyncratic um, own museums, um, questioning uh, the order of things, questioning the order of the institution, the discourses that were going on and so on. But maybe that is not so much the question. It could be a productive um, outcome, intended on intentionally or not, but maybe as as I understand more and more from the from the um, discussions that we've Ari and I and we are having here, but Ari and I have been having for the last months, we are doing a seminar together about this in Berlin. Um, the question is maybe not so much about how this reflects back onto the field of visual art and the practice that is um, conventional uh, in the field of visual art, but actually how more in a way a little bit how, how I think just mentioned how how can the, the framework the mindset the framework that is um, the norm so to speak in the field of visual art be taken as a resonance room right as a trigger for uh, um, asking questions about um, the self understanding of what it means to make music for example not for 20 minutes in a concert in the evening at a concert hall, but for six weeks um, in a space that can be entered only in the day. Or maybe then, to speak very practically, this Kunsthalle for Music wouldn't be open in the day because the conventions have it that music is being listened to um, in public uh, only in the evenings or mostly in the evenings. You know? So there are all these, from very, very practical question of like how do we rehearse in relation to the time that is usually uh, there for um, setting up an exhibition, right? Um, how do you relate space to time, right? Um, maybe an institution, a Kunsthalle for Music is a, is it would be an institution that has to be considered more in terms of um, s temporal organization, right? Maybe not having six or seven things going on in the same space at the same time, but uh, having things taking place one after the other, and how do you organize that? Um, so these, I think, the, I think the resonances that are 
as I understand it, productive in, in this idea of the Kunsthalle for music. Yeah, maybe I'll pick up on the question of norm because I think it's an important notion, right? Because ultimately, um, kind of your position is that there's certain norms within the field of contemporary music that are counterproductive to its evolution, or evolution that you consider to be correct, right? That that's a driver of your practice. Uh, you know, the question of norms, the relationship to the notion of norm in the field of contemporary art is notoriously difficult, right? Because on the one hand, kind of contemporary art is ontologically based in kind of negation of norms and actually like constant redistribution of what norm is, et cetera, et cetera. But as you know, it's no coincidence that I mentioned the backhand previously, there are still certain norms that drive this field, right? Whether they go as deep as the fact of private ownership, right? Or whether they are even just, you know, what, what can be considered as a relevant contemporary art, et cetera, et cetera. So it seems that kind of, for me, the greatest potential about your project is reconsidering norms on both sides and actually kind of using this sort of back and forth movement between what are presumably distinct fields in order to potentially kind of reconstitute models for both. And um, then to pick up another word that you may have used, maybe have not used, ephemerality, but I guess you were saying, you know, maybe it's not going to be a sort of thing that happens, it's a, it's a sort of place, uh, program that happens, that you, you know, in standard blockbuster museums where you have five shows, et cetera, et cetera, but actually uh, something that engages more with the sort of temporal dimension. Um, and, you know, from our conversations, I gather the ensemble itself, it already has a certain kind of ephemeral presence, so in a sense it's even more, uh, of um, ephemeral than contemporary art. But, and so contemporary art then becomes a platform through which it can circulate. I guess the, the problem then is then how do we renegotiate norms if contemporary art is just a platform? So this, this yeah, maybe somebody has ideas about it. Because you know, if, if we are, what we're looking for is this more kind of, uh, well, for the lack of a better word, dialectical relationship or like transformation through learning from each other and through reconstituting norms in a kind of productive, constructive manner, then uh, um, how does this happen if contemporary art is the infrastructural platform? Right, and I think these uh, norms in the, f in the field of, the, um, of artistic institution, the field of visual art, they all go back to the idea of the object. Um, and of course, in a white cube, anything can happen, and we are way beyond um, an object-oriented um, um, terminology of, of, uh, of visual art. But still, down deep into until the uh, up to down to the like say ways of um, insurancing or um, handling things um, and so on, um, the the very structure of of artistic institutions still. Um, take their self-understanding and their norms of code of conduct and behavior and treating the object of art from um, uh, a distinct um, uh, thing that is available all through the time uh, that the exhibition is up. Um, whereas in the performing arts, arts the, there is another norm, obviously, right? So, so that would be possibly uh, also one, I think, interesting um, and very simple in a way, um, point of departure to keep thinking of um, um, how to build an institution. Ex by the way, institution building is something that usually happens in failed states, right? Um, so <laughs> maybe you're talking about a failed state here. Um, so, but um, it could be an interesting f further point of departure for thinking about how, to, how do I build around an institution around something that is not a physical object that is there available all the time, but is th is another kind of object. It is an aesthetic object, a performance, but it has its different needs, requirements, but also um, potentials. Right. But still, <coughs> I'm really like still haunted by the question. So uh, you said like it's it's it never happened before. There's no precedence. So it's a genius of Ari coming up with this idea, or is it like an? Is there a kind of um, necessity maybe uh, from within the logic of musical development? It, I don't mean it as a joke, right? Is it is it an idiosyncratic idea, um, uh, or I mean, I, I, I believe the question is. I think the question is: is, is it coming from the? Is it the question is: is it coming from the? Fee, um, is it a 
is it a question that has arisen through um, the discourse of um, artistic production? And I'm, I'm sorry, we still need, we always talk about the, the transition from one discipline to the other, but they still exist, I think. Um, or is it something that is coming from the outside in, right? Uh, or from, you know, taking up something from, uh, from the place? I mean, I... Maybe it wasn't clear. I mean, I purposely chose the example at the beginning to dispel any idea of like genius or whatever. Basically, that example was meant to say I had a problem. I need to. S I needed to solve that problem. <laughs> I'm not the only one with this problem, and I even think there are some uh, some of the composers that we've invited. I think we'll hear from them tomorrow that they, in different ways, uh, share this problem. I'm by far not the only one with this problem. But uh, we need to acknowledge uh, that there's a problem, and the problem also has a lot to do with production. So we're talking about institution and the idea of a Kunsthalle for music and a new institution. A big, big part of this is the idea of producing work. How does one produce work if it's not fitting into any of the available modes um, that, are, that make work possible in the first place? This is a very, very big uh, issue uh, in music because what's interesting uh, with music, if you think about it, if you take a step back and kind of analyze it, you, you see that, uh, as a, let's say, as a production model, an economic model, music makes no distinction um, at all between um, 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 uh, a music, let's say, that serves, you know, that's, that's perfectly in sync uh, with, uh, let's say, a popular, let's say pop, let's just call it pop music, right? So pop music is a music that's grown up with the recording industry, um, there's, um, and there's a lot of great pop music. So just to be clear about that, this is not at all about you know good or bad. But the point is, this is a kind of music that has grown up with the recording industry. It is a studio music fundamentally. In English, we even have this term uh, recording artist, you know. And I think it's actually I've sometimes thought, well, it's a shame that we don't really that this term recording artist hasn't kind of um, caught on because actually it's so accurate for a certain type of musician composer to be a recording artist. Yes, they work with recordings, they work in the studio. Very often when they give a live concert, the concert is kind of a simulacrum of the recording and not the other way around. So it totally fits, you know, for the popular artist who's making a kind of product that totally works as a recording, that's a kind of, has a kind of mass appeal, um, sells many copies, uh, uh, can sell many tickets, uh, the model that we now have completely works. But what's kind of strange, if you think about it, is for the musician or the composer, uh, and it has a few different names, and I think this is also something we'll talk about, I think maybe Peter will get into it a, a little bit, but you know, we call it new music, we call it contemporary music, we call it experimental music. For all intents and purposes, it's, it's kind of considered the same thing when you look at it from a genre, from a genre perspective. And the thing is that this work doesn't work at all, like not at all, on a, on a quantity-based model of selling recordings or selling concert tickets. And yet, it's all in the same, there is no other model. I mean, there is no other way as a musician or a composer. You either sell records or you sell tickets. The only problem is, as an experimental composer, uh, you know, you sell you know, 50 or 100 records and you sell 20, you know, and if you're, if you're Lady Gaga, you sell millions. And that, so the point is what, so this, so this is a very, also a very big part of the Kunsthalle for Music and when we're talking about institution, um, and again, as, as I hope we'll uh, avoid any kind of idea of uh, a kind of genius creating, no, it's really a very fundamental drive uh, where can I make my work? How can I produce this work? And how can we come up with new models that will propel something um, into the future as opposed to looking back and also being held in place by, uh, for instance, government subsidies, which are also slowly disappearing? Yeah, I mean, as you were explaining the kind of uh, the pop music paradigm, and then you know, Armin was putting this question, like, why you, <laughs> why did you come up with this? I think it's, what, what's really interesting there is ultimately what you were saying about the pop music is a question of scale, right? The reason that model works is because of its scalability. 
Um, and so ultimately, like as a, as a composer, the reason you'd be interested in institution building is to be able to offer yourself the sort of scalability that can allow for sustained production. And so then, I guess, to come back to our initial question, what is it about institutions that makes, let's say, this project into Kultalia for music, like rather than you know just a series of events that within the contemporary art space, but actually a project of coming up with institutional form, it's this question of scalability. Um, and I don't know, maybe I thought maybe, do you have any thoughts about how that actually functions in this field? Because it seems, it's not that you know the contemporary field is so scalable, but there seems to be quite an easy transference between, let's say, cultural and financial capital, right? That allows for the kind of scalability that um, is done through pure quantity in something like pop music. And that, I guess, is quite a unique uh, condition. Not to Abs say that's entirely good. Like no, absolutely. It has it's a, a lot of problems. Um, you should start thinking about the Kunst, a gallery kun for music, maybe then, as, a, as the equivalent to the Kunsthalle for music, because that's the distributive system that, uh, as we all know, I mean, it's, uh, um, the production of visual art relies on, if we speak of or think of, um, visual art in these terms, right? Um, simply, you can easily sell one composition um, that will be owned by one person and only if that person allows anybody else to show it or perform it, you know? That can easily happen once you label something a work of art uh, and it has a different um, way of distribution um, from music where you give your position um, um, uh, composition to a publisher and then, you know, there's a whole different system. But m uh, briefly, I think we have to come to an end shortly, but I would like to um, also again practically tackle one other thing um, that I relate to um, the term of the Kunsthalle. And that's a, a very old notion again, um, but we've come um, to... Uh to get used to the idea that the institutional framework, both mentally but also um, infrastructurally, of um, a Kunsthalle or any um, similar artistic institution um, guarantees that whatever we find inside there has a certain level of what somebody decades ago has called the uh, aboutness, right? The aboutness of, of the work of art, right? So, um, Thinking of, or having with this in the background, um, tomorrow we are going through um, auditions for for an ensemble, right? Um, but isn't an isn't an ensemble already a very profound institu an institutional decision for what direction that institution is going to take? Wouldn't it be possible at the same time, or to imagine, let's say? Um, somebody who is not skilled at all, um, taking up a guitar for the first time, um, becoming an interesting object of a console for music, um, and not um, some, uh, you know, working with the, with, the, with the underlying assumption that something that is being presented there needs by necessity some sort of skilled ensemble, whatever that may be, we will find out. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, just to just to clear that. I mean, the idea is that this uh, ensemble, this to be formed ensemble, is sort of the core of the of the Kunsthalle for music. But that doesn't mean it's absolutely the only uh, presence in the Kunsthalle for music. A situation like you describe, um, and I can think of a few works, um, even one or two of my own, would totally fit into that and be possible to be shown. But I do think this idea of an ensemble, and again, it's this little bit this idea of borrowing from music and applying it to, to a kind of, and, and what happens, this idea of, of an ensemble of different, of musicians, but also of performers and of different, uh, there may be in this ensemble, um, for instance, a professional violinist uh, right up against an amateur violinist, but both are very, very strong performers, and they would both be in this ensemble. So the idea of an ensemble that's, that's at the heart of the institution but not, but not to the exclusion of everything else, um, is is what we're talking about. Yeah. I have one very quick question because my my initial question uh, I was interrupted. I didn't get further than the genius. Um, uh, I'm sorry. But I want to. I know it's, 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 I mean, I've got to come up with 
important question for the, the lively debate, I hope. But uh, the, um, so there is no precedent, right? Um, so if there's no precedent, uh, it, it can either be the genius who has a idiosyncratic idea, or there's a certain historical necessity. And I think it's very important to, to understand uh, that the question of a music institution is not just an idiosyncratic thing that we, well, uh, we like Ari or, or uh, uh, Daphne is also interested in it, but, but it has a certain necessity. You explain very well wh where it comes from in your own work and, and, and you'll see in many others' work. Um, there's a thre third party in this equation that's, that's contemporary art work. Wh what, is, what is its interest? Uh, uh, it's not uh, generous. I mean, like I know many novelists philosophers who go to the art world because they have to survive. But they gotta give something, right? So my question would be like, as a, a final statement maybe to the three of us, what's your assessment? Why is contemporary art like interested? What does it get from it? Um, what, what you get, what you're hoping for uh, is, is, is clear to me, uh, um, but, but yeah, um, I want a philosophy institution, contemporary art, nobody will listen. So what, uh, what is, the, what is the, the interest from, from the contemporary art field itself? Can we ask Daphne? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, you, you knew that question. Um, I think, I mean, before even conversing with Ari, I mean, there has been many conversations that took place also with Mimi Brown at Spring Workshop like six years ago at Performa about 10 years ago that was born as a space to present commission research performance in ways that museums were unable to do until then. I mean, 10 years after you look at what Performa has done, especially in New York, every institution is producing. They started their departments, their acquisition committees, and it's sort of a different landscape now when you look at performance vis-a-vis -vis music. I think some of the structures that exist in music worlds that are missing very much in the way art is created, in the way art is distributed, in the way art is collaborated upon, you know, in terms of scoring, instead of improvising, in terms of sequencing works. I mean, there are certain aesthetics that are inherent in music that the art world is somehow not able to bring in into its symbolic conveyor belts, which is what institutions, contemporary institutions use. E so there is a projection there. Can we learn something out of the structures and processes that are inherent in the music world. But of course, when you engage into a discussion with somebody like Ari, he would say you're fetishizing the music world because we actually look towards the music world, uh, you know, towards the art world because we feel so homeless in our own world. So we actually need to kind of find that in between. So, so for us, it's really finding, you know, the threads in between and learning from each other, for sure. Kunstale for music, which maybe Ari didn't really mention, but when we started talking, he said, I want an ensemble, I want a repertoire that sort of looks at this restaging and performance aesthetics of what an a, a, a repertoire might be. So it is, you know, from Haydn to Baldessari to, you know, maybe Kanye West, you would say, a repertoire that is unleashing something that may not be existing in any other institutional model. And the third thing he brought out is education, which was really interesting. Usually, you know, if you bring out the question of education, people want to fall asleep, but <laughs> but the way he put it also is like, why in art education we're not learning from composing? Why are we not learning from scoring? It could be the essence what drives exhibition making, curating, installing, and so forth. So there's something in it you kind of wonder, like why is art education you know, edu sort of avoiding the topic of uh, music? Why is it not embracing it more? So it is mutual approximations in many ways, but then you want to be careful as a white cube institution not to co-opt, not to, you know, that's what art world does. Art world is this generous place where homeless philosophers or homeless um, dissidents uh, could find a place, but on the other side, some of the structures of music, as you mentioned, could be very informative including what you mentioned vis-a-vis -vis labor relations in the way an ensemble could be created that is not necessarily music or art world. Yeah, Am so I long? I, I hope it became clear that we are like um, talking about something that it ha has a much more general uh, uh, importance than that it even goes beyond music and, and the question of, of, of the institution. And we talked a lot about music is not. I would, I would say one can also pronounce it music is not. I mean, phenomenologically, you know, it's frequencies, oscillation, it never has a presence. Um, and this is a hint to, to our next session because now we, we have a little break. 
or to be a thinker somehow of the contemporary, of contemporary art, Peter Osborne. Before that, we have a very short break of 11 minutes because we have a four minute delay. Still, we did well, I think. Uh, thanks a lot to everyone and also Daphne for this coming up. <laughs>